Hello, this is James Cook of the University of Maine at Augusta Social Science Program. And if we think about crime as a social condition that describes a social problem, how can we begin to understand the patterns of that problem? That's what this video is about. Uh, one of the strongest patterns that we can observe in social science regarding crime has to do with the social dimension of age. This is called the age crime curve, in which criminal behavior tends to start in early, early adolescence to increase during the adolescent years, and then to steadily decrease throughout adulthood, after young adulthood. It's a general pattern. It has been observed in country after country, year after year, across time. Perhaps gender is the only other variable that better predicts uh, criminal behavior. And uh, age uh, is in some ways a better predictor of involvement in criminal behavior because it predicts not only whether one is engaging in a criminal activity, but also whether one is a victim of a criminal activity. To take a look at the age crime curve, um, in a theoretical sense, we can think about Travis Hershey's seminal theoretical work uh, in social bonding theory, what he later called social control theory. In a six, 1969 work, he described attachment to conventional others. So are you in a social uh, setting in which you are uh, uh, connected to um, conventional people or unconventional people? Are you committed to your school, to your career, to your family, or are you uncommitted? Uh, what is your level of biographical involvement? What in social movement literature is called biographical availability? Do you have time to be going out and doing things? Or is your time committed? And finally, um, what is your level of belief? Have you been socialized into accepting these conventional norms, partially through what? Attachment to conventional others. So one of the things that Travis Hershey uh, described throughout his decades-long career as a criminologist within sociology was this notion that there is a period of time in uh, the life course in which attachment to conventional others um, from childhood through uh, teachers and parents wanes. Uh, one is not controlled by those any other uh, any longer. Uh, as one goes through adolescence, that control wanes. Commitment to school and career and family. Um, well, commitment to school is waning as one gets uh, a little bit older. One gets freed of that, but is not yet tied down by career and family. Um, who has the most available free time? Certainly not young children who are, if you look at especially young children, chaperoned from the home right to the school bus. And then right when they get off of the school bus, there's often someone waiting to escort them inside, at, at which point if they want to go out in a hallway, they need a pass. Um, time restrictions are different in late adulthood. Um, and, and middle adulthood, when individuals are embedded in a family that places time demands on them, embedded uh, typically in a work situation with time demands placed on them, um, often uh, a circle of friends, uh, a series of voluntary organization memberships, uh, could be in churches, could be in civic organizations, could be committees that people sit on. Uh, local governance, all kinds of things that people do that take time away from what might be made available toward crime. And um, socialization into accepting conventional norms, into accepting the culture around one, is something that happens over time and is more likely to take hold in uh, middle and late adulthood. Not yet 
in early adulthood. So all of these factors, according to Hershey, lead individuals who are in late adolescence, when they're getting freedom um, and they're not yet controlled, to be especially likely to participate in criminal activity. One form of deviance, what we also might think of as a bit of cultural innovation. So if we want to take a look at the statistical um, basis for this, we can look at government statistics, particularly the Bureau of Justice Statistics, um, online at bjs.gov. And there's a particular um, publication uh, that is online. It's a data tool that allows us to look at the most recently available uh, information on arrest statistics. For this data tool, the most recent uh, uh, patterns available are in 2014. So to look at this, we, we click on that link. We're going to select national estimates. And there are many possible trends here. I'm going to make this larger. But we're going to look in particular on the right at age arrest curves. And then we could look uh, at particular offenses, all sorts of offenses, um, or we could look at all offenses. Okay, We could look for uh, any particular year from 1980 all the way up to 2014, the last year for which this was updated. We could look at the offense by age for males and for females. Let's take a look at what was going on in 1980. And let's take a look at age in general. Okay, and let's look at all offenses. We can make that graph by clicking the Make Graph button. And then we simply scroll down to see. And what we see here is the arrest rates by age for all offenses. Uh, in uh, criminology, that arrest rate is not a percentage because crime actually is at a lower rate than uh, per hundred. Um, so that if we looked at it uh, uh, per hundred, we would actually have a very low rate that would be difficult for us to interpret. Um, but for 1980, the, how about the arrests per 100,000? Well, that allows us to get a larger number that is more pleasing to the eye and also a bit more pleasing to those who want to create the appearance of higher uh, numbers, greater numbers of, of, of crimes. But at any rate, arrests per 100,000 peaks. We see here uh, in the graph at what age? Shortly before 20. Uh, very low at uh, just after the age of 10, and it drops so that by the age of 30, it's very quickly declined from late adolescence, um, still high in the early 20s, but very quickly by the late 20s is low and slowly gets lower and lower and lower until after the age of 60, the likelihood that a person is to be arrested um, for uh, all, any kind of offense, is about the level as, as that you might have at the age of 10. We could take a look at differences according to gender. And we would see the same pattern for males as we would, making the graph again, for females. For females, there's a bit of an earlier peak, but it's largely the same. So that was in 1980. We could look again in 1990 and look at the offense by age. It's this pretty much the same pattern in 1990. We could look again in the year 2000. year 2000. <laughs> Here we are. But our weight shows that it's basically the same graph. And in the year 2014, the most recently available year for this data tool. Let's make the graph again. 
Arrest rates by age for all offenses. Again, peaking slightly before the year 20 and declining afterward. It's a very consistent effect. What if we, instead of varying by gender or varying this um, pattern by the year, uh, what if we look at particular offenses? How about murder and non-negligent manslaughter? One of the prime categories of um, violent crime and its severity. Here it's peaking right at year 20, so a little bit later, but only by about one year. We see the same general trend and then declining afterward quite sharply. There's a term called, this is a term, it's outdated and it is an official term of the um, Department of Justice that was recently um, changed. It used to be called forcible rape. Since then, we have had the cultural understanding that um, uh, r all rape is non-consensual. And so that term has been removed, but in 2014, it was referred to as forcible rape. And we actually don't have data available for that year. Okay, let's see if we have data available for that for the year 2000. Sometimes some data is not available. And there we are. Again, peaking for this violent crime before the age of 20 and then declining. And we could go back in time, uh, all the way back to 1980, and we would see a similar effect. Okay, in which you're peaking around the age of 20, and then it declines. For any one particular year, there might, as you can see, be a little bit of shift about which year gets the, the, the top, but it's that general age, late adolescence, early 20s, that's the peak, and then it declines from there. But what about robbery, which is different from burglary, where robbery is a violent crime involving a threat to a person? We're making the graph and we're waiting for it. In 1980, robbery arrest rates peak shortly before the age 20, is high through the early 20s and quickly declines afterward. If we went forward to 2014, we'd find the same pattern. The point is that it occurs over and, whoop. <laughs> let's try to uh, refresh that graph. There we go. Over and over and over again. I hope I'm impressing upon you that for the ages that we see here, from 10 to above 60, that um, we're seeing the same general peak in the rates before age 20, a little bit high in the early 20s, and on and on. What about burglary, in which there's not a direct threat to an individual, but instead a threat to property? What do we see there? We see the same. So it's not just about violence, but it's also about threats to property. What about motor vehicle threat, theft, stealing a car? Again, it peaks before just before age 20 and it declines. What about forgery and counterfeiting? Now here's an argument in which we might expect to see um, a peak later in age. After all, um, counterfeiting and forgery is something you have to learn over time, right? Um, let's find out what the arrests tend to be. Here we do tend to see a little bit of a bulge outward, but still the peak in arrests is just uh, right around age 20. And then there's a general decline afterward. The age crime curve still holds. What about embezzlement? When you think embezzlement and you think someone who's been arrested for embezzlement, what do you think of? What person do you have as, in, in mind with an image? 
Um, is it a man? Is it a woman? Is it an older man or older woman? Or a younger man or woman? Well, when we think about the arrests that are actually made for embezzlement, surprise, surprise, the peak in the arrests per 100,000 people in each category, each age category, uh, it peaks just before age 20. So we can keep looking at these things. Vandalism, right? Now there's one where you think, oh, vandalism, that's a, a young kid, right? As opposed to, we think, embezzlement, although it turns out <laughs> it's the same. Okay, so here it's peaking just before age 20, and then it declines afterward. It's the same. Um, prostitution and commercialized vice. Peaking, in this case, a little bit after age 20, but really pretty darn close. The consistency in the overall effect is similar. And we can even think about driving under the influence. Oh, <laughs> the data doesn't exist. How about drunkenness? Here we have a peak after age 20. Why is that? Because the drinking age is 21. And yet for the, 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 the late teens, it's still pretty high. Okay, and then it declines afterward. Disorderly conduct is the same. Vagrancy, the same, right? Um, and so we can conclude that there is a general age crime effect. I encourage you to uh, look at this tool, experiment with the tool to see the general pattern. But returning uh, to our presentation, we can consider how interesting it is that that is occurring so strongly in the late uh, teens and early 20s when we think about um, the distribution of people because most people are not in the late teens and early 20s. As a matter of fact, in 2014, the year that we were considering, um, this is data from the American Community Survey and the US Census Bureau, which uh, collects that data. The most common uh, year category of age in 2014 was 50 to 54 years, thanks to the baby boom. More people out there, but less crime. So one of the things that's interesting about commission of crime is that um, it happens in typically in relationships. Um, people either commit a crime against another person or against another person's property. So there is a, a pattern in how we associate with other people called homophily, which says we don't just go up to people randomly and commit crimes, just like we don't randomly engage in any kind of social relation. Crime is a social relation between a person and another person or a person and another person's property. And it turns out that in general, another general social science trend, uh, there is a pattern called homophily in which people tend to disproportionately, more likely than by chance alone, form social ties with people who are very much like themselves in terms of race, in terms of religion, in terms of levels of education. People associate with people who have similar low levels of education, kind of job, occupation, but also in terms of age. People tend to associate with people who are very much like themselves in age. Teenagers associate with teenagers. 20-year-olds associate with 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds with other 25-year-olds, or maybe 24 and 26-year-olds, right? 20-year-olds very rarely associate with 60-year-olds. So that means that there is an age crime curve for victimization as well. The people who are most likely to be victimized are the people in the age range uh, of the late teens and early 20s. Why? Because that's where the most 
criminality occurs. And criminality occurs along social ties to very similar people. So uh, Bauman Catalano produced a, uh, an analysis in 2012 that was looking back at 2008 uh, victimization data from the National Crime Victimization Survey. And it had to do with stalking in, in which one person is following another person around, uh, going to their home, threatening them. And in the National Crime Victimization Survey, uh, the victims of stalking were asked, well, what is your age? And then they were asked to describe what is the age of the, the person that is stalking you? What do you pre perceive their age to be? And in some cases, they knew very clearly. Um, and in, in some cases, they didn't. And they said, well, make a general guess uh, in uh, an age category of were they under 18, 18 to 20, 21 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, or were they 50 or older? And then the, 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 the victim of stalking was asked the same question. Now, you can read this graph like um, a topographical map, like looking at mountains from above. And the lowlands are places where 0 to 10% uh, across a row right, uh, of victims, um, uh, 0 to 10% of responses occur. So for those who are victim age of 50 or older, less than 10% of um, the offenders they report are under the age of 18 or at the age of 18 to 20. Uh, maybe 10 to 20% of them are in that 21 to 29 uh, age range. And then what if 30 to 40, we get into the 20 to 30% of responses. But where are most responses? 40 to 50% of responses, the, 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 the majority or 30 to 40, but it's in the also saying that they are 49, 50 years of age or older. As you get uh, victims who are a little bit younger, it turns out that the most common response uh, is that also their offenders were a little younger. When you're getting to the point where you're talking about victims who are in their 20s to 30s, guess what? Their offenders most often, not always, but most often are in their 20s and 30s. And when you're talking about folks in their late teens to early 20s, uh, the National Crime Victimization Survey does not um, uh, interview very young people. Um, it turns out that most of the people who stalk young victims are also young offenders. And what this means um, is that if there are more young people, you will expect to see uh, more young more young people who are offenders, you'll see more young people who are victims. And that is the case. If we're looking at uh, the the percentages of uh, those victims uh, who are in different age categories, the highest percentage uh, is in the late teens, early 20s. And the two categories that are next in, in line in terms of their, their frequency, what percentage of the time they occur, uh, are teenagers and then folks in their late 20s, early 30s. Um, and this is from the 2017 uh, National Crime Victimization Survey, uh, which is a survey of victims saying, have you been a victim of violent crime and how old are you? Um, we have an image sometimes of little old ladies, right, as a cultural phrase, being victims of violent crime. But it turns out that the, the elderly are the least likely to be uh, victimized. And the young are the most likely to be victimized. So looking at that same 2017 National Crime Victimization Survey data, we can um, ask in general, not just about stalking, but in general for victims of obviously non-fatal violent crime because we cannot ask murder victims uh, about their offender age. but We can ask everyone else who survived 
what is your age, what is your perceived offender age. And then we can compare that to the percent of the population. So the percent of the population of a particular age range is in blue here. Uh, so, right, there are no victims 12 or younger who are interviewed because uh, that's just not a, a, a population that the United States government, in collecting its government statistics um, through the Department of Justice, has decided it's appropriate to interview. So they're just excluded um, and not asked to fill out a bunch of surveys about their crimes. But older victims are. Um, so the age of 30 or older, it's uh, more than 70% of the population, but it is um, about 55, 56% uh, in 2017 uh, of the victims and only about 49% of the offenders. So for those 30 years of age and older, both victims and offenders uh, occur less often than in the population, less often than you would expect by chance alone. For age 21 to 39, uh, well, that age range is only about 15% of the population, but it is about 20% of victims and 20% of offenders. So it's occurring uh, about a third more than you would expect by chance alone or, or, uh, or, or so. And for those in, in the age range of 18 to 20, well, we're talking about maybe 4% of the population, but um, for victims, double that. Um, and for offenders, uh, certainly a lot more than that, even though that's, that's all in a low range, that's because it's a low percentage of the population. Uh, but they're much more likely to occur there. Okay. And uh, for those in the age range of 12 to 17, uh, about 9% of the population, but about 15% of the uh, victims and 15% of the offenders. So this doesn't immediately look like an age crime curve like we were looking at before, but that's only because age 30 and older, which is you know, 30, 31, 32, keep counting all the way up to 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 80, 45, all the way up to 100. It, incur, it, it involves so many years of age that, uh, of course, there's going to be more uh, victims and offenders there, but that's because there's just so many more people, uh, more than seven out of 10 people occur there, and yet um, far fewer uh, uh, than we'd expect from the population are victims uh, and are offenders. That's the age crime curve in action, disproportionately young. These are the references um, that I've included uh, or made use of in this presentation uh, regarding social control, regarding homophily, and regarding um, patterns in crime in the United States and in population in the United States. Take a look at them yourself if you're interested in replicating this um, data from the United States government regarding a very pressing and important social issue.